privilege to work with the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines to hold this webinar on water birds in Manila Bay and Nauvoo Lake, wetlands in the midway of the flyway, the East Asian, Austral Asian flyway. This webinar is in celebration of the World Migratory Day. And in keeping with this uh, celebration, we're going to have uh, experts from the region, and uh, we're going to have focus on three special sites in the Philippines. To formally open this webinar, I would like to invite Mr. Anson Tagtag, a career officer in the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. He's an avid ornithologist and has worked on these birds for 20 years or, or more. So, Mr. Ansan Tagtag. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anadel, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. And yes, good morning, uh, friends and colleagues in bird cons conservation. It, it really feels good to commune with everyone uh, virtually. So we are still on with uh, the World Migratory Bird Day celebration, which started uh, last week. So in behalf of the Biodiversity Management uh, Bureau, uh, I congratulate the uh, organizations, uh, collaborating organizations who organize this uh, forum, the Wetland International, the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines, and the Partners for Resilience and uh, for, uh, for convening this forum. And it's also nice to have uh, Dong Lee from the Bird Life International as one of our speakers, um, adding, to, uh, adding an international flavor to this uh, online forum. So uh, I would say that our online forum today is indeed uh, an opportunity to shed, la shed light on the controversial uh, issues confronting our most important wetlands, including Manila Bay and uh, Nauhan Lake. And um, as some of you have participated in our uh, preview, uh, previous um, uh, webinar on World Migratory Bird Day, like on October uh, 9, the coexistence between uh, migratory birds and the farming communities in Kandaba wetlands was uh, highlighted. It was, I believe, an uh, eye-opener, especially for participants from the local government units uh, surrounding the Kandaba wetlands. And uh, we emphasize that coexistence can only be made uh, possible uh, only if we adopt practices that fully recognizes the value of wetlands and uh, migratory birds. <laughs> and also, um, it was highlighted that Kandaba wetland serves as a sort of a plaza where, you know, there's this intermingling of domestic and wild birds posing a significant risk uh, uh, from avian influenza. And so, uh, in the, the Philippines, uh, we are aware that we are no longer a bird for free a bird flu uh, free country uh, where a number of avian flu outbreaks already occurred beginning uh, 2019, uh, 2017. And uh, if I may share uh, further, we emphasize in that forum in October 9 that um, uh, coexistence can be achieved if functional wetlands in uh, uh, the Kandaba uh, area uh, is formally uh, recognized as integral part of our um, agricultural landscape, and also that biosecurity in livestock farms and the maintenance of uh, wetland habitats are key to, you know, limiting uh, wild bird and domestic uh, uh, bird interaction to prevent the occurrence of zoonotic diseases. So these uh, realizations are actually included as part of our national response to the COVID-19 pandemic and on the prevention of emerging infectious disease, uh, diseases in the future. So uh, it is my hope, therefore, that with uh, the recognition of wildlife conservation and protection as part of our national response to COVID-19 and uh, emerging infectious diseases in general, 
uh, as well as with the wetland conservation policy uh, of the Philippines now under uh, deliberation of the House of Representatives uh, uh, we will uh, hopefully gain more uh, legal and political support for wetland conservation and um, also we had this um, forum on 10 October uh, which highlighted conservation efforts of the flyway network sites and inevitably the uh, controversial uh, Panay Gimaras and Negros Bridge, which is under the government's build, build, build program, was, was uh, also raised because of its potential impact to one of our flyway network site, the uh, Negros Occidental Coastal Wetlands Conservation Area or the Nokwaka. So in this uh, previous month du uh, during our ECQ and uh, GCQ uh, periods, uh, stakeholders from uh, the Nokwaka uh, uh, site level uh, up to the national level um, have uh, convened and uh, discussed uh, to strategize on how to go about you know voicing our concern on uh, the potential impact of this uh, project and uh, it is encouraging to share with you that our um, DNR secretary had uh, recently communicated uh, formally with uh, the Secretary of the Department of uh, Public Works in High Waste with uh, recommendations for adjustments in the project location to avoid the uh, potential impact to the Nukwaka area. So with this in encouraging developments, I think that um, our group, our sector, more than ever is uh, charged with uh, the energy to continue to advocate uh, for science-based and biodiversity-friendly approaches to infrastructure uh, uh, development projects uh, affecting our wetlands. And uh, well, the other day, um, the Wetland International, represented by Ms. Anadel Kabanban and Mr. Arnie Jensen, uh, and together with BNB, uh, convened to strategize for a win-win solution on the impending infrastructure. Uh, in portions of Manila Bay in Bulacan. You know? So with that said, um, this forum highlighting the biodiversity and conservation of Manila Bay is indeed uh, very timely as we take on another battle towards you know, ensuring the ecological integrity of our very precious Manila Bay for the benefit of migratory birds and people. So thank you once again and uh, happy World Migratory Bird Day to everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Anton Tagtag. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, the encouraging uh, developments in the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and uh, the Department of Public Works and Highways. We are indeed uh, encouraged to continue our work on the conservation of birds and their habitats. And now I would like to, in to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Yong Ding Li. He is the program manager of BirdLife International based in Singapore. He manages BirdLife International's work and communications. And uh, he, uh, as well as uh, oversees research projects in 12 countries. As a scientist, his research interests are faunal assemblages in human modified landscapes, tropical biodiversity, migratory birds, which is the topic of our webinar today, tropical ecosystems, and their conservation by local people. He has worked across a range of tropical and temperate landscapes and across Asia and Australia with birds, mammals, and insects. He has written or edited six books on the biodiversity of Southeast Asia and China. So indeed, he is uh, our expert for the work on the migra migration of uh, birds in Southeast Asia. He's going to give us a talk on the challenges to the conservation of migration, migratory birds in Southeast Asia. Dr. Yong Ding Li.
Hi, good morning. Thank you very much, Annadelle, for the very uh, comprehensive and flattering description of my, my career. Um, it is indeed a, a pleasure to be here today, um, joined by old friends and colleagues from across the Philippines. Um, and uh, I would like to start off by firstly um, thanking Wetlands International uh, Philippines, as well as the Wild Bird Club for uh, initiating this very important forum to bring together the, the, the wetland conservation community to talk about some of the most um, important issues concerning migratory bird conservation in the Philippines. Uh, and of course, I'd like to also thank um, uh, Anson uh, from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources for presenting a really uh, updated overview of some of the uh, most uh, confronting issues uh, that we are faced with in, in, in wetland conservation in the Philippines. Uh, my talk today um, is going to give you a very, very, very broad overview of, uh, of uh, migratory bird conservation in, in Asia. And given that I'm in the company of uh, experts um, who have done lots of field work and has very good on the ground understanding across uh, the country, I will leave the details to the lineup of speakers. Um, what I aim to do is to give you that general understanding of some of the really uh, confronting challenges that we have with respect to migratory bird conservation in Asia and specifically here in Southeast Asia where you know we live amongst one of the most densely populated regions of the world um, and then of course we will then pass on to the other speakers to hear from them uh, as to what is happening on the ground. So I'm just going to turn on my share screen right now um, and then uh, you should be able to see my slides. Okay. All right. So, um, Asia, a very uh, one of the most, well, if not the, perhaps the most important regions for uh, for bird conservation globally. Um, we know that Asia is obviously the largest continent in the world. Um, how important it is for conservation is very clear. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, the numbers are, are right in your face. Um, if you look at how many species of birds we have got here in Asia, in total, we have got more than 3,000 species. We find that the majority, uh, the vast majority of the world's migratory, uh, the vast majority of the world's threatened birds are actually found here in Asia. And if you do a really quick count, about three, three of 10 of the world's threatened bird species of the world are found here in Asia. So that really puts Asia in the, in the spotlight of bird conservation. And it also at the same time means that um, conservation work has the um, opportunity to make the greatest difference in, in this region. And where does Southeast Asia fit into that bigger puzzle of Asia? Now, Southeast Asia is the region that we are in. It's a really densely populated region with more than 0.6 billion people living in an area less than 5 million kilometers square. So obviously we are facing a situation whereby one of the most densely populated parts of the planet overlaps is one of the uh, biologically yeah. richest parts of the planet. Uh, Southeast Asia is very important for biodiversity conservation globally and particularly for bird conservation. Uh, and the numbers, of course, do not lie to us. We look at the numbers and we see that uh, despite the fact that Southeast Asia only cover uh, a little more than 10% of Asia's area, a third, about a third of the um, threatened species of Asia are actually found here in Southeast Asia, including uh, virtually um, and more than perhaps 66% uh, of the uh, threatened migratory species. Now let's move on into migratory birds in Asia and put things into perspective to see where we fit in the world. Now Asia, um, obviously, as I've mentioned many times already, takes up a large chunk of um, the world. Uh, and many of the world's migratory species use or pass through Asia. Um, with a, a quick count of the numbers of migratory birds, we've got more than 350 species of uh, over 600 uh, bird species in Asia, which are considered as long distance migrants, which means that they move considerable dis distances from Northern Eurasia uh, to, to uh, Southeast Asia. Um, for those of us who are into migratory birds, we are really well aware that uh, at least uh, two of the world's largest migratory bird flyways overlap with Asia. And here we are in the Philippines, 
we are right smack in the heart of the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Um, that's quite a mouthful. It is one of the most important, if not the most important migratory bird system in the world because it connects the largest area of land mass in the in the world um, and of course uh, if you look at it from an ecosystem perspective this flyway is very very uh, important ecologically because it, it not only connects species it also literally connects the ecosystems of northern asia northeastern asia southeast asia as well as australia all the diverse ecosystems ranging from the tundra of um, high arctic russia to the tropical forests and wetlands we have here uh, in the philippines um, so migratory birds form a really important element of, um, of the bird life of Asia. And coming more specifically to the East Asian Australasian flyway. Now this is um, the most important migratory bird corridor in the world. But if you look uh, a little bit at the map that I've got here on the, on the screen, uh, we find that this flyway overlaps with one of the most um, crowded part of the planet. Yeah, you've got you've got uh, countries like Korea, China, Japan, and many of the countries in Southeast Asia, which all adds up to the more than 1.8 billion people. So we are living in the most crowded flyway on the planet. Uh, so it's not really surprising that we find that the East Asian Australasian flyway is also at the same time the most threatened of the world's um, eight or nine migratory uh, flyways. Uh, we have more than 20 species of water birds that are considered as threatened, I think more than any other flyway. And here in the Philippines, we are sitting right in the middle of a very important migratory corridor along this flyway. More than 120 species pass through the Philippines on their migrations further south. And a significant number of these uh, migratory species actually also spend their winter here uh, in the ecosystems of the Philippines. Uh, coming back to the numbers, um, and you might recall that earlier on I mentioned that we are living in the most threatened of the world's flyways. How threatened it is, you can see that there are, as of 2019, at least 61 species of migratory birds that are considered as threatened with extinction. Um, the majority, of course, we know are water birds. Uh, we know that um, there are many other species that are being threatened. Um, and as we do more and more research on them, we are beginning to understand the scale of, of the situation in, in, uh, in this flyway. Um, I would like to also spend a bit of time uh, making a quick reference to this region in the flyway called the Yellow Sea, because the Yellow Sea is such an important part of our East Asian Australasian flyway. Australia, um, the Yellow Sea sits uh, somewhere near the northeastern part of the flyway uh, between the Korean Peninsula and mainland China. And uh, if you look at uh, shorebirds in Manila Bay, for example, or anywhere in the Philippines, or even more broadly across Southeast Asia, you find that many of the birds that we have here in tropical Southeast Asia may have been uh, tagged when they were passing through the Yellow Sea. And that, of course, tells us how important Yellow Sea is relative to the whole flyway because um, you could see it as really the bottleneck of bird migration in the flyway. A lot of the bird species, especially shorebirds moving from North Eurasia to tropical Southeast Asia would have passed through the Yellow Sea region on their ways to the tropical south. So uh, put together, you've got the East Asian Australasian flyway, the most important flyway of the world most threatened flyway as well because we've got so many of these uh, threatened species and uh, coming within this flyway you've got the yellow sea which is perhaps the most important point within the flyway a region is undergoing rapid change um, and therefore any any um, you know long-term degradation of the ecosystems in the yellow sea has repercussions across the flyway uh, uh, more widely um, the statistics for our migratory birds in general across asia is not particularly encouraging. You've seen in my earlier slides that we already have the, uh, the uh, notorious figures of having the most threatened species. The science tells us that many of our migratory species are in decline. Uh, we know very well that uh, species such as the spoonbilled sandpiper or the Notman's green shank uh, have all suffered really rapid decline in the past two decades. Uh, species such as the spoonbilled sandpiper is considered as among the rarest of the world's shorebirds suffered something like uh, as much as a 90% 90, 90 decline within a period of two decades. But that is of course not all. Um, the unfortunate thing for our migratory birds is that even many of our supposedly common species are in decline. And I give you one 
quick example of the, the marsh sandpiper. The marsh sandpiper is not really amongst the most threatened of the world's or of the region's migratory shorebirds, but it's another shorebird that's undergoing rapid decline. Um, I share with you some figures from my colleagues at the Nature Society Singapore. Um, they've been doing censuses of uh, shorebirds for many years, and they find that over the last two uh, decades, there has been a substantial decline of this bird, considered formerly as one of the commoner of the shorebirds in, in Singapore, for example. Um, so, having reached this um, point in my presentation, you've seen um, where we stand in the world, where we stand in the region. You also see that uh, we are not in the best state in terms of bird conservation because so many of our species are, are in decline. Uh, endangered species, we've got the most. Even common species are in decline. So a, a common question that many of us will be posing is, what are the problems? What are the challenges? What are the exact threats that are, that are responsible for driving these declines? The science shows it all. And in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of emerging work that tells us exactly uh, what is the problem within the flyway? What are these problems at the, the regional scale, at the local scale, and what should we do about it? Uh, obviously, one of the most important threats to our migratory birds is the issue of habitat loss. Uh, we see that Asia is very crowded. There's a lot of uh, plans for future infrastructural development. And you could see that almost everywhere you go in the region, there are ongoing projects for large-scale land reclamation, which of course comes at the expense of some of our most important coastal wetlands. Uh, you find that in the case of Southeast Asia, um, there is a, a significant amount of unsustainable development of our coastline, even though we know that there are going to be consequences on our ecosystems. Uh, we find that everywhere from, from Myanmar to Indonesia to here in the Philippines, there is a lot of uh, stuff going on on the coastline as we begin to clear uh, or degrade our wetlands for infrastructure, for, uh, for agriculture, uh, for aquaculture, for instance, expansion or the intensification of fish ponds, uh, as well as the building up of, uh, of various industries. You know, um, a very important study that was published about two years ago uh, by our colleagues um, Nick Murray and and et al. showed that uh, amongst the different kinds of uh, of coastal wetlands we have uh, in the world, mudflats are one of the most um, at risk. You find that uh, based on the on the kind of data that we've, we've collected on mudflats for the last 10, 20 years, uh, mudflats all over the world are in decline and especially here in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, but of course, habitat loss is not the only threat that are faced by migratory birds. We know that uh, there are a lot of other insidious threats. Uh, one of those that um, I work closely on and I'm beginning to realize how serious it is is the issue of hunting. Uh, hunting is not so well understood because um, there hasn't been that many studies or that many people running around on the ground to quantify it. But uh, in recent years, we are beginning to find that hunting poses a substantial threat to our, our birds in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, my colleague here out in the field um, has obviously found that in many parts of uh, mainland Southeast Asia, for example, there are a lot of uh, hunting pressure that we don't know until very recently. Um, we've got um, extensive use of mist nets um, in the coastal areas of Southeast Asia where local people try to harvest large numbers of water birds for sale uh, to make money uh, or for, or for uh, subsistence. Uh, if you visit some of the, of the markets in Southeast Asia, you know that um, hunting is uh, obviously a serious threat to birds, uh, even though this is not so well documented. Um, and within surveys that we have done in markets from Vietnam to Myanmar, we know that uh, many of our water bird species are threatened by hunting um, and likely to be at unsustainable levels. Uh, but hunting and habitat loss are not the only threats. Uh, there are other broader threats, um, institutional issues as well, which impede our ability to, to deliver conservation of our migratory water birds. Uh, if you look at Southeast Asia more broadly, um, you, you know that there are already many sites that have been identified that to be of importance um, at the regional level or at the international level for bird conservation. And, and fortunately, many of these sites are already receiving some forms of protection or others. Uh, however, however, I'd like to point out that um, there are, of course, challenges in the way we protect our ecosystems. And across many parts of Southeast Asia, we still find that many of the most important sites for bird conservation, and specifically uh, migratory water birds, remain 
uh, very little protected or are totally unprotected at all. So there's obviously um, huge challenges that we face in relation to how we are protecting our most important uh, sites for, for migratory species in this region. Um, and of course, uh, last but not least, I would like to draw special attention to the fact that uh, at this point in time, uh, as much as we think we know a lot about migratory birds in Asia, there are still some very large gaps with respect to where we think we know migratory birds are going. And I'd like to draw attention to a study published by a colleague uh, just a couple of years ago uh, that explicitly tracked the migration of the great knot. Now, the great noise is obviously one of those uh, better known migratory birds that passes through the Philippines on its way to Australia and other parts of Southeast Asia and was for, for a time thought to be one of the better study of the species. But uh, this study, this particular study by our colleagues um, in, in the Netherlands found that uh, even for a species such as the great knot, we still don't know a lot about where exactly the great knots are passing through on their migrations. And they found that uh, uh, of the different sites that are used by great knots, for example, many of these sites were previously unknown to conservationists. If you look at the map on the on the right side of the screen, uh, pay special attention to to the white circles. The white circles are exactly what I'm talking about. These are sites that were not known to be used by the great knot until this study was done. And if you look at the, the broad distribution of white circles on the map, you find that so many of these white circles or so-called unknown sites are concentrated here in Southeast Asia, uh, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and in Malaysia. So putting all these things together, we see that uh, our migratory birds are facing tremendous challenges, um, especially here in Southeast Asia. Um, we've seen that uh, habitat loss is obviously one of the most important threats uh, to our migratory birds. But of course, that is not all. We know that there are other emerging threats as well. Studies have shown that hunting is definitely one of these threats we should keep a watch out for and find ways to, to deal with. Um, so what are we doing here at BirdLife? Uh, migratory birds are a very important priority for us at BirdLife and uh, we have got a dedicated frame uh, of work um, focused on migratory birds, um, trying to protect them at various levels from within the country level to across the flyway. Um, we've got specific projects working on uh, site-based conservation, so our conservationists here are on the ground working with local people to um, strengthen conservation at those sites. We are also uh, oh, working to address some of these broader issues uh, relate in relation to uh, migratory bird conservation and recently we worked very closely with our government colleagues and NGO colleagues to to establish a, a new grouping within the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership to look into the issue of, uh, of bird hunting in the flyway. Uh, but of course, more broadly, we're also working to, to deliver capacity building for local communities. Uh, there's ongoing work to research and understand the ecology of our migratory birds. And, and of course, most importantly, we want to put the science into policy and practice. So there's of course a lot of, of work in relation to advocacy to, to get governments to be more aware of the issues faced by migratory birds. But of course we cannot discount and underrate the importance of international cooperation. Uh, migratory birds travel across different countries um, they span different regions and for, for us to actually have a real impact on helping migratory birds, there is a need for us to, to constantly pursue international co uh, collaboration and cooperation to better study um, and to work on the common issues faced by migratory birds across this flyway. Um, so I would like to end my presentation once again by thanking my colleagues at the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines and Wetlands International Philippines for inviting me to join on this forum um, and a little cartoon from a little bit of work that I've done recently to share about what are the, the most pressing challenges faced by our migratory birds. Thank you once again for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yong Ding Li. That was a very impressive lecture on the challenges to the conservation of migratory birds in Southeast Asia. I, we have, I recorded four. Uh, these are loss of habitats, hunting, institutional issues for the protection of international bird um, IBAs, inter, uh, international important bird areas, and uh, gaps in knowledge in the migration of the species that are migrating. I hope that uh, this uh, lecture will inspire people to conduct the research 
work with uh, organizations, work with uh, their local uh, local governments in the Department of Environment and Natural Resources in the case of the Philippines to uh, ensure that uh, these issues are addressed. And uh, I, uh, we have uh, a far more minutes in uh, Dr. Yong Ding Lee's uh, time. Maybe we can um, entertain uh, one or two questions or comments. Sounds good. Yeah, happy to take on some questions here. Thank you so much for keeping your time. Pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah. I don't see anything in um, the chat box. Although, yeah, there's uh, a congratulatory note here from Ms. Christina Zinko. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much, to yeah. you, Dr. Dong Lee. Congratulations. Um, another congratulatory note from Aryan Baluyut. Thank you very much. And uh, do you have any question in the, um, the platform, Facebook? I, I, I maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put in the comment, um, um, building on um, what um, our colleague uh, Anson has mentioned, um, and also building on to the upcoming presentations. I think, I think this is a very important opportunity for us to discuss uh, some very pressing issues um, in Manila Bay. I mean, Manila Bay, I've been there a couple of times and uh, obviously it's one of the most important sites for uh, migratory bird conservation in the Philippines. Um, it's, a huge, it's a huge site which makes, um, makes things even more challenging because uh, to effectively conserve it, you need to, you know, um, get different stakeholders to work together. So I, I really hope that we have some really good conversations uh, subsequently, you know, to talk about how people um, from different organizations can work more closely together to advance um, conservation activities on the Bay to save some of this really critical mud flats that are used by migratory birds moving from um, Japan, China onwards to the Philippines. And many of these birds actually use the, uh, the ecosystem to the Manila Bay to move on to Malaysia uh, and Indonesia. So there's really um, uh, important but fast narrowing window of opportunity for us to do uh, what we can to conserve uh, all these shorebirds, terns, herons that use Manila Bay. Uh, including some of the most endangered species we have, right? We've got the uh, we've got the black faced spoonbill um, and things like the far eastern curlew. Yeah. Just briefly, oh, we have a, just a minute now, so uh, <laughs> we can continue the conversation during the open forum, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Mr. Mike Liu. Um, for now, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Arne Jensen. Mr. Arne Jensen holds a master's degree in science. He is currently an associate expert of Wetlands International with headquarters in the Netherlands. He has worked in the Philippines in various projects with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, World Bank, Wetlands International, Philippines Program, and other organizations for over 20 years. He has collaborated with DNR and the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines in conducting the counts of migratory birds in the Asian water bird census for many years. He has prepared a report for Wetlands International as well as International Union for the Conservation of Nature on these uh, data set from um, Manila Bay and uh, this report can be downloaded in the websites of uh, IUCN and Wetlands International. So now may I invite uh, Mr. Arne Jensen to give his talk on the migratory birds of Manila Bay, conserving and restoring their ecosystems and habitats with focus in Bulacan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am very pleased to see the diversity of participants. Thank you so much, um, both to the Wild Bird Club and to, um, to Wetlands International Philippines for hosting this. And I was very glad to listen to the introduction by Mr. Anson Taktak. 
I'm saying this uh, because if you go to the next slide, you will see you will see that we have had a uh, outstanding collaboration. She, next slide, please. Uh, we have had an outstanding collaboration with DNR uh, when it comes to uh, the International Water Bird Census here in Asia, the Asian uh, Waterfowl Census. And uh, Ms. Anadel mentioned Manila Bay that I first saw some 30 years ago and I have been stunned by this huge, huge area ever since. But let me go back to what Ms. Anadel mentioned about, about the birds of Manila Bay. It also surprised me that despite Manila Bay is named as a key biodiversity area, KBA number 25, which is supposed to have in really world-class, extremely important wetland habitats and high numbers, high diversity, for example, of, uh, of uh, birds, water birds, there was actually nothing published and nobody could really tell me uh, where to go and find the birds. And I, as many of you, I really like birds, I love the birds and I want to see them. So we took up the challenge and I was so happy that citizen science helped me in over a period of more than two years to traverse the entire coastline of Manila Bay and find out where are the birds actually congregating and what does the what does the habitat look like? So this is an example where you combine science-based uh, science-based guidance with individuals from government and from civil society. And I would like to recognize the many members of the Wild Bird Club uh, and uh, at the local level at DNR, uh, several people that have joined many of these inventories. Um, and I, of course, also have to mention though it was all volunteer work that the support through the uh, Partnership for Resilience from the government of the Netherlands uh, and from ISN Netherlands National Committee actually made it possible, made it possible to uh, have the necessary energy and fuel uh, to make a publication. The you can find uh, by going to Wetlands International's website, or if you want to do it quickly, you can just type in Water Birds of Manila Bay and, and you will see then, if you click there, up cups IUCN Netherlands, and there is the file. Next picture, please. Um, Dingley excellently presented about the uh, the flyway, so I will not spend much time on that. But for those of you who are not familiar with, with migration, you can see here, you can see here to the right that the Philippines is one of, of 22 countries, the middle of the flyway, where you have a huge movements of many millions of birds, including water birds. We do not know so much about it. There are actually more sites in the Philippines where, from where we know very little or nothing, as Ding was mentioning with the Great Knot. But we do know by the, by the uh, Asian Waterfowl Census that we at least cover enough sites and we at, normally have data for around half a million of the many millions uh, of, of uh, water birds moving from and back. Um, so the birds use the Philippines as a stopover refueling place. It is just like us humans when we travel long distances, we need to have a place to sleep and to eat before we want to proceed. And we actually do not know much about the transmigration of, of water birds from the Philippines. The, the things we know is essentially derived out of the annual January midwinter count which is less than one day per site. And this gives us an insight in the overwintering areas and what birds you can find there. But, you know, monitoring is more than, more than just to see and count some birds. This way we get an idea about the status of the birds. But importantly also, 
the AWC um, gives data on the conditions of the birds and the wetlands, and therefore also the threats to the, these, uh, these birds and the habitats they live in. And I would say importantly, if the loop is going right, it will also give you uh, ideas on how you can propose actions for management. So whoever is managing these sites, well supported by knowledge, you can take decisions in favor of protecting and managing the, our migratory birds. Um, may I have the next slide, please? So this essentially just mirrors what um, what Ding was saying. You see the Philippines in the middle of the flyway, and this is just the left picture, a sample of satellite tagged uh, water birds moving up and down. And actually many of them, uh, as I said, moves the far distance the whole way to Australia and even to New Zealand. And a great deal of them um, also stays in, in the Philippines in the middle of the flyway. Next slide, please. So here you can see, and, and to the left of the slide, uh, a summary of what we are talking about. I don't think, because you can read it yourself, that I have to mention it all, but roughly this huge bay, this is a semi-enclosed bay in the West Philippine Sea, um, is nearly 200 kilometers long and covers 200,000 hectares. For those of you who have been in Europe, where we have the famous uh, Watten Sea shared between Netherlands, Germany and Denmark, in comparison, I think this is about 300,000 hectares. So what do we find along the coastline? Roughly the entire intertidal system has been disconnected by, by uh, uh, development such as fish ponds, but along the river mouth, we still have remnants of intertidal and riverine uh, uh, wetlands. In total, there are 27 rivers and the outstanding Pampanga Delta in the north of Manila Bay, I call it the Venice of Manila, is a, is a water world. But we can also note, unfortunately, just the last two years, three out of 10 top bird key biodiversity areas are lost, either to illegal reclamation or by a decision of reclamation in one or another form. The recent one is a decision to, uh, to convert about 2,500 hectares of wetlands right north of Manila. Uh, so overall, the whole ecosystems of the birds are threatened by water pollution, agriculture expansion, coastal development, reclamation, airports, new roads. On top of this, the sea level rise starts to take back the reclaimed coasts. Um, because the coastline originally was many, many, many kilometers inland where the peak tide with the salt reached the land. But nobody has seen it in a generation or two. Um, so within that area of the former wetlands, you now have huge problems with land subsidence because of too much extraction of, of, uh, of, of uh, fresh water. Together, it reduces the important wetland areas, and importantly, it reduces the options both for local people and for migratory shorebirds. Next slide, please. Here, just a rough overview of, uh, of the northern part of Manila Bay. To the left, you have the province of Bataan. In the middle, you have the province of Pampanga. And to the right, you have uh, Bulacan. If you look at the uh, the blue line out in the water, that is roughly where the coastline were uh, about, about 60 years ago, three generations or two generations ago. And the yellow line shows where the, the so-called coastline is today. But if you look on top of the map, where it says SAS1, for example, you can see all the dark areas. These are all converted converted habitats. You once had almost 85,000 hectares of diverse mangrove forests, swamps, intertidal flat seagrass space, but it has all been reduced to a little under 19, or, or, sorry, 20,000 hectares. So it's a quite gigantic loss. Next slide, please. Okay. 
And here in summary, you can see uh, that from the 84,500 hectares, uh, not so long time ago, you are down to around or less than 20,000 hectares. So this is a gigantic loss of habitats of relevance for, uh, for water birds. It's a loss of more than 75%. Next slide, please. Um, what protects migratory birds and their habitats in the Philippines? Um, at least in the theory, I would like to highlight the uh, Wildlife Resources Conservation and Protection Act, uh, under which you are not allowed to hunt or to kill or collect um, any wild uh, bird species. And it also gives options for the local government to come up with critical habitat protection areas. In Manila Bay, we only have less than 200 hectares of 0.5% that are protected. Um, and that brings me to two important initiatives taken by the government of the Philippines, namely uh, in 2017, at the uh, conference of the parties, uh, of the Convention on Migratory Species, the Philippines suggested to conserve critical intertidal habitats and other, ha other habitats for uh, migratory species. So in principle, that should cover protection of about two thirds of the water birds in Manila Bay. And lately, also proposed uh, by the Philippines during the, uh, the COP of Ramsar in uh, 2018, resolution number 1822, same, promoting conservation and wise use of intertidal wetlands. That was well taken by the other um, members of this convention, I think about 170 countries, uh, all supported the initiative by the Philippine government. Next slide, please. So let our journey begin. I said we have spent several years traversing around. Here are some pictures of my team. Uh, we, uh, you, we, we walked, we used boats, we used helicopters, we waded, and it is a great, great adventure an exciting activity to be out in the bay. Next slide, please. So in summary, again, you can read to the right, you have a little sample picture at low tide from the coast of Bulacan of some of the small long distance, uh, long distance uh, shorebirds. It's a, you can see redneck stint, you can see, you can see lesser sandflower, for example. So you have almost all of the waterbird species in the Philippines. The regular occurring one is about 105 species and, and uh, almost 75% or 70% of those are migratory. 16 species occur in number, species populations occur in numbers of international importance. And at 30, about 38 of these are actually also covered under the Convention for Migratory Species. And as Ding mentioned, it, as an indicator, these birds, you know, if you see my screen now, the, these birds you can use as a thermometer, as an indicator of the status of uh, the environment in general. In Manila Bay, we have 13 species that are either threatened or near threatened, following uh, the Department of Environment's uh, Resources uh, uh, DAO 2019-09, which elaborates what are the Philippine threatened species. In midwinter, in the coastal zone, because we do not know what is further inland, we only covered about five kilometers along the coastline, there are around 200,000 birds. It sounds as a lot, but you also remember that in principle, they are sharing 200,000 hectares. So in any case, this is the highest number we can document from any wetlands in the Philippines. About 80% of these birds are located in just about 8,500 hectares in 10 geographical area. And some of these occur in some stunning high percentages of the flyweight populations. Uh, let me just mention, for example, Whisker Turn, where it appears that a quarter of the whole population are in Manila Bay. Next slide, please. And let us just in memory of what it was to traverse Bulacan coastline, uh, especially a hundred years ago, you will find several of the Philippine pelican, even having the name of the Philippines as its taxonomic name, 
it is unfortunately extinct. And the blackface unbills, for which there are many, many records, again in Bulacan, it has become a just irregular visitor in, uh, in the Bay. Though our team in January 2020 were very happy to find 24 of these stunning, uh, beautiful uh, blackface boombills in what is now becoming a new airport for the Philippines. Next slide, please. I was mentioning that in the Bay, you have 60 species populations that occur in very, very high numbers, more than 1% of the flyway. Let me just mention, um, aside from the whisker turn, you can have some huge uh, congregations of uh, the Pacific Golden Flower, uh, almost 19% of the population, huge congregations of black winged stills, Kentish flowers. But let me also say the reference, because everybody's talking about the new uh, airport, that you can see about 10% of the Pacific Golden Flowers within what is going to become the airport, and about 7% of the Whisker Turn population. Next slide, please. So here, roughly, I just, because many of you may not know very much about the habitats of Manila Bay, I just divided up in, in simple groups the families of water birds, eaters, herons, shorebirds, gulls, and terns. And if you go to the right in, in the uh, table, you can see that they are not evenly distributed. So, for example, in foreshores areas and rivers, you mainly find gulls and terns. In the tidal flats, you um, at low tide find egress and herons, but importantly, all the shorebirds. And in the fish ponds at the uh, high tide, you can also find some of the shorebirds, but importantly, the egrets and the herons. The mangroves on its own, and I'm only talking about the migratory birds, these are basically preferred by egrets and, and, uh, and herons. Next slide, please. I did a rapid um, I did a rapid analysis of one of the key sites, a very important site up in the north of the bay, which is called uh, the Pasak River. There's a stunning little beautiful uh, mudflat island called Pankong Malapat. And I ran through all the data we have. In 2005, uh, Bird Club member Maspata Rias uh, visited the area about, about 15 times over a couple of months. So that is what I call the baseline for this area. And this kind of analysis are important to understand where are the increase and where are the decrease and why, what caused the changes. So if you look at the table uh, to the right, you can see I divided again the habitats, the fish ponds, which are preferred by egret species and also black wing stills, the shallow waters, which are mainly preferred by terns and gulls, and the mudflat species, which roughly are all the shorebirds. In 2020, that is the next column you can see in the table, 2020 AWC, you can see the numbers and compare it with the baseline. However, it is always dangerous to draw conclusions just on, on one set of data. So I ran the 17, sorry, um, seven, that would be uh, the eight years of data uh, that we have from the AWC and calculated the average values. And you can roughly see that the shallow waters, for example, have very stable number of water birds, which got turns, although on that side, all the blackhead gulls disappeared largely uh, from 7,000 in 2015 to only 280 in 2020, and significantly a huge decline in the tidal flats. There are 11 shorebird species in decline in that locality and only Kentish flower seems to increase. Next slide, please. This can, uh, and I apologize for that, this can look a little bit overwhelming. Um, the, the essence of this is that we analyzed the AWC data, uh, some of them way back from 2013, per sample stations, and those who are in the Philippines and know the Philippines know where is Balanga, Pasak River, Pampanga River, Tansa, and LPBT stands for 
the little uh, the little uh, Ramsar site in Manila Bay in the Paranaque Wetland Park. And all the red figures shows where that declines uh, and the blacks uh, more or less the increase or stable. So if you look to the very right, you have a column which says Trans Manila Bay and you have a column which says Trans the East Asian Flyway. And INC means increase, DEC means decrease, and uh, STA stable. So roughly, there is a complete match comparing the fly with Manila Bay. You have, for example, 11 of these uh, species uh, which occur in international port numbers in decrease. In the flyway, it's 10. You have a decrease by uh, increase by five. In the flyway, it's an increase by one. Next slide, please. So this is just for you who doesn't know Manila Bay, you only know Manila Bay from the area around the, the Bay Wall, that this is where, where you have your original habitat, what it looks like. Typically, the old growth mangrove in the background, followed by a white, white area of, uh, of mud flats, followed by the more sandy, uh, mud sandy uh, foreshore and the open waters. The picture to the right, to the left, is one of the key sites um, uh, that shows um, that shows uh, the area called uh, Talib Dip uh, in the south end of Bulacan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And here, just some sample. I took. I, I noted. Uh, please go back. Here is an example of a great knot congregating on small uh, banks of shells. Uh, this is also from the Tadiktip Airport area. The slide to the left, you can count yourself, it's about a one square meter. It shows the enormous, by the enormous biomass that you find in, in, in tidal flats, all small shells and snails, etc. Next slide, please. And I just want to mention, because it may be a particular problem for the Philippines, but as you can see on the main slide, you see all the small Kentish flowers walking around on the mud flats in between thousands of, I call them toothpicks. This is actually not toothpicks, it is a foreshore mangrove planting. And the mangrove planting makes it uh, very difficult for the, for the long distance migratory water birds to feed. So consequently, the number drops. These pictures are, for example, again, from a Bangkong Malapad in Pasak River. Next slide, please. And um, I mentioned that because uh, the, these uh, mangrove plantations grows into a very, very dense wall of green where it's impossible for the majority of the migratory birds to feed. Here to the right, you can see for the Northern Manila Bay, um, the key areas of water birds of international conservation importance, meaning that there are more than 20,000, 20,000 birds or so several threatened species, uh, etc., etc. If you if you take the walk with me on the map from the left to the right, you can see the first one is called the Balanga Pilar. Oh. Afraid his uh, connection is broken. Uh, let's give it uh, a minute uh, to reconnect. Um, if, if not, we can go back uh, to to the remaining slides uh, later. Okay, he's back. Okay, we can, um, I'm so sorry that uh, there is a... 
Are you still okay, I will continue. So if you look to the left, the figures, the AWC 2020, that is result from the water bird count in Manila Bay uh, this year. And I put in the average values that we, we uh, made during, uh, during the study, uh, the, the two year study. I apologize for the error. It should not be 2006, but 2016 to 2018. So the black figures in bracket shows shows what should you say the peak numbers you can see um, and uh, the red numbers uh, shows what was counted in in 2020. the sites i have already mentioned please uh, can you can you go to the next slide and here are some here are some samples of these extremely important sites that are left. Uh, less than 1,500 hectares in Bulacan hosted about 30,000 migratory water birds, mostly shorebirds. And if you look at the map to the left, this is one of the very, very last, very last uh, intertidal uh, wetland systems of flat, uh, intertidal uh, tidal flat system. And you can see the diversity you can see the diversity of mud flats, uh, the sandbanks, the natural mangroves, and importantly, if you look up up at the map, you see some white spots. These white spots are all salt pans, and that is where most of the water birds goes up during high tide. And most of the time, you know, there's there's high tide. So the coexistence between the private landowners of these salt pans. Um, with the foreshore areas run or managed by the local governments uh, to some extent by DNR is extremely important. So the old type of protected areas will not work without the involvement of, of landlords, uh, landowners, etc. etc. The the uh, for those who doesn't know about the salt pans, the birds doesn't like the salt pans, but the shallow areas behind the behind the salt extraction area is is very peaceful and the water is very shallow, so therefore there are a lot of these birds. Next, please. Here I just summarize where food and shelter is the water birds are. If you look to the left slide, you say tidal flats and mangroves, and here you have all of the 200 kilometer Manila Bay, you see a lot of small red spots. That is the tidal flats and the mud flats, which unfortunately now uh, will become below 1,000 hectares. The largest one, the 315 hectares, you can see on the map, it says Bulacan, that is where the new airport is going to be. The tiny small green spots represent less than 1,000 hectares of mangroves left, of original mangroves left. To the right, you also see there is a connect between the habitats and the food. Where the food is, the birds are. That shows uh, the density of fish lawi. Every spring, every March, April, May, a lot of, uh, of fish eggs and, and, and small baby fish by the current is pushed into the shorelines of Manila Bay. So you can see the highest red color, for example, shows the maximum density of fish biomass. And for though, and there's a little insert uh, down to the right button, which shows for example, the coast of Bulacan, where the density was 100% of these tiny small uh, fish thing. And for those who are not a fish expert, you just take your binocular and go look for the turns. The turns are where the, where the fish food is. Next slide, please. Arne, sorry to interrupt. Can you please wrap up in a minute or two? Thank you. That would not be possible, I'm sorry, because I'm asked by my glue also to give a, a briefer on the, the airport. But roughly, uh, the water birds, the water birds are where you see to the left the yellow, the yellow spots and the blue spots. And if you overlap, overlap with discussed uh, development, you can see that many of these developments, about 18,000 hectares, overlap with the dense areas, with the ten, dense areas of, um, of uh, fish biomass and huge congregations of water birds. Please proceed to the next slide. I was asked by the Wild Bird Club to give a summary on what do you find in, uh, in Talipti Bambang. So I, I'm sorry, I need to 
add a little bit more time. Next slide, please. This is from uh, this is from the new airport area. Next slide, please. So to the left, you can see uh, the area, which is 2,300 hectares, which overlaps with one of the key bird areas. Please go back to the first slide. May I have may I have the slides with the airport, please? Okay. So very quickly, it is intended to serve from 100 to 200 million passengers by four runways and with movements for per runway, which is a 60, 60 aircraft movements. So that makes 240 aircraft movements per hour. To the right, you see uh, this, uh, the coastline of the same area and it's called Felip Tip and the other area right next to is called Bambang. Next slide, please. This is just an eye opener. You have 14.6 hectares of rich mangroves, about 15,000 mangrove trees, and about 315 hectares of tidal flats. Next slide, please. So typically around this area, the fish ponds and rivers adjacent to what become the new airport can look like this, particularly in the early morning where thousands of birds are flying in or out from the fish ponds out to Manila Bay and back again in the late afternoon. We do not have many data on this, but we have enough data to show you the pictures. Next slide, please. So in summary, you have seven threatened species, of which the four are uh, shorebird species, and you also have your own, uh, you know, your own native Philippine duck among the extremely uh, threatened species. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So there is about 700 hectares, hectares of coastal wetlands with up to about 24,500 water birds. Uh, please do not shift the slides. So if you protect about 500 hectares along the coast of the new airport, including 200 hectares of the shallow waters, you would be able to protect the life cycle of many, many protected uh, populations and threatened species. The map to the left shows the key bird area with the red color of the forthcoming airport. The slide to the right shows, among other species, um, uh, great nuts and the other threatened one, the red nut. Next slide, please. So, I'm also asked the question, can a wetland with water birds and an airport coexist? In short, the answer is yes, but there are some caveats. You can see two samples to the right, that is John F. Kelly, the airport in uh, New York. The yellow line shows where is the airport. The green lines or green circle shows the three wildlife sanctuaries next to John F. Kennedy Airport, which is uh, sometimes full of large flocks of wild geese. The lower map, the second example, shows Copenhagen International Airport in Scandinavia, which is neighbor to a, a Ramsar site with about 70,000 uh, breeding and migratory water birds, plus another little uh, sanctuary to the west of the of the airport. So in short, yes, wetlands with water birds and an airport can coexist, but there are some caveats. Next slide, please. So in short, the conclusions is that, for example, Bulacan Coast can hold more than 47,000 birds, and there are actually more species, nice. water bird species and the other areas. That the 10 sites of international importance, you have lost three in just two years. And uh, um, the challenges here, the options, I would say the positive one uh, is that if you can come up with legal protecting agreements between landowners, local governments, DNR, to protect just 5% of the bay, there's still a glimpse of a hope for our migratory water birds. But it, 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 
it will have to include participatory protection with those who are living there in the coastal communities and with benefits to them. It also has to be based on nature-based restoration of the tidal flats. And there are some no-goes. For example, there are many options to plant mangroves in the fish ponds, uh, and it should not take place on the tidal flats. And there's definitely should be a no-go on using the mud flats as backfilling for reclamation projects, because the backfilling is gigantic. It, it will be hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cubic meters. And lastly, we are still hanging with the so-called Manila Bay Sustainable Master Plan. If that can be funded and implemented, there is a little bit of hope for our migratory water birds. Next slide, please. Anyway, this ends my, uh, um, this ends my presentation. I apologize for overshooting my time, but I thought it was important that the bird club members uh, got what they asked for, a little oversight of what is happening in Taliptip Bam Bam. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Our next speaker is Don Jeff Tabaranza. Don Jeff Tabaranza is a wildlife biologist. He took up bi BS Biology and Master's in Environmental Science at the University of the Philippines, Las Banas. He has been into biodiversity research and conservation for two decades now. In the last eight years, as the research program manager of Mindoro Biodiversity Conservation Foundation. Early this year, he joined Haring Ibon, Bird Finder, and he will be launching bird, birding expeditions and community-based conservation programs in sites throughout the Philippines as soon as the COVID-19 situation clears up. An avid bird watcher and wildlife photographer, Jump is a member of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines and Wild Bird Photographers of the Philippines. May I invite Don Jeff Tabaranza to give a talk now on water birds in Wuhan Lake. Jeff. Thank you, Ms. Anadel. Let me just Drop. share my screen. All right, uh, so I'm going to show you uh, the situation in Nauhan Lake and the birds that we can find there. Um, okay, first off, Nauhan Lake is the fifth largest lake in the Philippines, having a surface area of just over 8,000 hectares. Uh, habitats uh, is mainly dominated by the freshwater lake um, and the freshwater river systems. Uh, there are marshlands and peat swamp forest, uh, mainly in the uh, northwest part. Uh, there are lowland forests in the southeastern part and um, agricultural lands, mainly rice paddies near the marshlands and fruit orchards near the lowland forest. So uh, you can see there uh, a sample of uh, the habitat in uh, Noan Lake. So Noan Lake was uh, first declared as a national park through Presidential Proclamation 262 in 1956 by President Ramon Magsaysay. Uh, the protection covers over 21,000 hectares of the lake and the surrounding habitats. Uh, it has also been recognized as an important bird area by the BirdLife International and Haribon Foundation and a key biodiversity area by DNR and the uh, Conservation International. Um, in 1999, it was recognized as a wetland of international importance or what we popularly known as a Ramsar site. Uh, it is uh, wetland number 1008. Okay. No. The Ramsar information sheet for Nauan Lake mentions uh, that there are 15 species of water birds. This was back in 1999 and highlighted five tufted duck the wandering whistling duck, uh, the great little intermediate regrets. Um, okay, so in 2001, there was an effort by DNR, formerly uh, PAUBI, uh, with uh, Wetlands International and uh, Nordeco 
to conduct a census. Uh, so as a result, they counted 11,580 tufted ducks, uh, whiskered terns, whistling ducks, and uh, other wetland species. So you can see the photo there in the lower right. That's part of the report submitted of that census. Now, uh, some of those might be familiar to you. There's uh, Ferdani Balete, Mamarlin, um, Yoshi from Wetlands International, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So uh, after 2001, uh, there were no surveys conducted around the lake for water birds. The next one was in 2008, as part of the AWC, and uh, the water bird census has been conducted consecutively every year for, for the past 12 years. Okay. So uh, what have we found? Um, over the 12 consecutive years of AWC data from 2008 to 2020, uh, we totaled 75 bird species. 55 of those are water birds. Uh, breaking that down, there are four endemics, 35 residents, 33 migratory, two with both resident and migratory populations in the Philippines, and one accidental. Or uh, if, I, if I may, it's possibly misidentified. The, that one record is of the water rail, which, I, if I'm not mistaken, is a European water bird species. It ranges from Europe to the northern tip of Africa. So it's quite uh, confusing how it arrived uh, in Nauhan Lake. So I, I would say it's possibly misidentified one of the our, uh, more common uh, rails or, or uh, other water birds. Okay. So um, around uh, 30 species are recorded annually during the AWC. So, um, okay, so what can we find there? We have the endemics, the Philippine swamp pens, and the Philippine duck, which is a threatened species. Uh, we have common residents, the purple heron. Uh, you can see there, it's, uh, it just caught a big tilapia. I'll talk about the tilapia late, later on. We have little grebes, we have wandering whistling ducks, which in the past few years, their population in Owen Lake that we counted was increasing. Uh, we have other common residents, the Brahmini kite, we have Java pond herons, uh, we have the hard to find pheasant tail jacana, always skulking in the vegetation. We have the migrants, great egrets, the whiskered terns, black winged stills, and then common green shank. Other migrants, uh, black-headed gulls, we have the osprey, uh, we have wood sandpipers, uh, we have the Eurasian coots, this beautiful jet black water bird. Uh, we recently recorded the Eastern Marsh Harrier, Noan Lake, and of course are the, the starbird for Noan Lake, it's the tufted ducks. Okay. Um, I will show you some data later on about the ducks. Okay. Uh, in the past, uh, four years, we have several new records. In 2018, we have Garganese for the first time. Um, we counted over 800, almost 900 Garganese uh, in that year. Uh, early this year, uh, we found, I think, six Garganese. Okay. Uh, also in 2008, uh, we found three Eurasian regions. Uh, we had a bit of difficulty having those identified, but with uh, help from, from experts like Arne, Desmond, and uh, Rob, we, be, we were able to identify those as Eurasian regions. We have that Caspian tern, the largest tern species in the world. Uh, it, it was a mix along with the uh, more common whiskered terns. And we have a beautiful common pochard also. We found, I think, five individuals in 2018. Okay. So other other uh, new records not previously in the AWC in Noan Lake are the pintail, northern pintail ducks. We have the northern shovelers. Uh, we had, I think, in 2019, uh, a black tailed godwit, uh, another threatened migratory species. Okay, so uh, usually when, when we present the data to the PAMBI and the, the public, uh, they usually ask where do the migratory birds come from. So before 
we we have the the generic answer that they 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 come all from the northern countries of the east asia australasia flyway china russia japan okay but uh in 2016 we had confirmation that uh, the tufted ducks we have we were uh, one of the uh fishermen who is also a volunteer lake warden surrendered uh, a duck which got caught which got entangled in his fishing net and he he found that it had a ring so we got the data we sent it we circulated it um, to experts and we found the data that it was banded from uh, japan from shinhama duck refuge okay in uh, a couple of years back so it was a, a very happy report uh, the fishermen uh, released the the bird unharmed within the same day and hopefully we can find some more uh, birds with bands in an own lake okay now uh going on uh showing you the data for awc of uh from 2008 um okay wait there's something um okay it i would just like to show that there's an it, a decreasing trend in the counts of the AWC counts. There's something wrong with the figures there. Um, okay, the, the lower line show the, the combined ducks. I think, wait, let me check. I think my Excel file duplicated the count for the ducks. That's why the total count is so high. Okay, um, the total AWC count would be at most. 5,000 uh, individuals higher than the total ducks count. So I, I think that's a double count of the total duck included in the total AWC. Anyway, uh, just to show you, uh, the ducks dominate the, the population in a, the AWC count of uh, Noohan Lake. Uh, particularly the tufted duck, you can see the lighter color there. So Ducks occupy maybe seventy-five to up to ninety percent of the counts that we have in Ohan Lake. The highest for the tufted ducks that we got are fifteen thousand. Okay. However, in the last uh, five years, that count has been dwindling. We we got only about seven thousand in uh, twenty sixteen, only less than five thousand in twenty seventeen. In 2019, we found a little over 100 ducks, about 120, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, in uh, early this year, we have about um, 700 ducked ducks. So uh, it's, a, it's a very, very sad uh, image that's being, being shown. So, um, so here, this is one of the photos we got in 2015 by uh, Alain Pasqua. This shows only a portion of the huge, um, huge flock that we found in the middle of the lake. Um, I tried counting the ducks in the, in the photo individually. I, I got to around 1,000. And if I'm not mistaken, the flock was at least three times that big. So. Um, that was back in 2015, where the count was about 15,000 ducks. Okay. Um, last year, this is the largest flock, the largest group of tufted ducks that we found. This is about 36 ducks. Okay. And then we find them in smaller groups like 20s, 15s, 20s, somewhere around that. So um, it's, very, it's very sad. No? So the question is, where did the ducks go? And uh, Arne and I have been discussing this uh, several times when we, when we meet up in conventions. And uh, he actually instructed me to, to <laughs> request from, from BMB, from Anson, to, to get AWC data from other major wetland sites. So unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to collect the data as I um, uh, transferred from, uh, I left MBCFI early this year. So um, um, 
top of mind, possibly the ducks went to Agusan Marsh or Lano Lake or Lake Mainit or Liguasan. So uh, I'll have to follow up on the data. I'm sorry, Arne, <laughs> I wasn't able to collate the data for you. Um, well, anyway, um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, since uh, 2017, um, we talked with the uh, Paso Rick Natividad of No One Lake to do monthly surveys. So, uh, DNR has been conducted quarterly B uh, BMS surveys in the lake to augment the date of AWC. But Paso Natividad was able to secure some funding to conduct it monthly. And uh, we uh, we were able to find more tufted ducks uh, towards the end of the year when they when they arrive uh, during migration in the in the burn months October November December it's it's still not the twelve thousand to fifteen thousand figure but we we do see one thousand to three thousand ducks arriving in the burn months however uh, when AWC when we start doing the AWC counts, we see only a few, a few hundred ducks. So it is possible that the, the tufted ducks arrive in numbers, but leave for, for other areas. So, and uh, what's left are the few hundreds that overwinter in own lake. So we see that a uh, few hundreds uh, staying in own lake uh, from January, February, up to March, or even to early April before they they head back to their northern breeding ground. So, um, still, it's not it's not the twelve thousand to fifteen thousand numbers, but uh, some of the ducks are still there. It's still in the in the thousands, but they they, they find somewhere else to overwinter. So, um, oh. Uh, what cause what causes the decline um unfortunately we don't have the answer to that yet uh there are some prevailing biodiversity issues in the area like the invasive alien species tilapia i mentioned earlier um the last uh, biodiversity survey recorded two species of the tilapia the melotica and the zili um and there are efforts from from another um, government agency uh, to to seed to restock. Uh, it's it's very sad actually that in in their request to restock, they mentioned tilapia as a uh, tilapia population as dwindling and it is now threatened in one lake. It's it's an invasive species. So how how could it be a, a threatened species in uh, in one lake? It was introduced decades ago, and they want to reseed. To put more fingerlings in on lake, so it's it's a uh, I don't I don't know what to <laughs> what to make make out of that um, use of uh, pesticides uh, fertilizers uh, in the agricultural areas in the rice fields in the fruit orchards is still um, rampant. Of course, the loss of natural habitats, conversion of marshlands, and uh, dwindling forest cover. Um, in the 20, 2003 data, it shows only 35%. Um, I couldn't find the more rec recent data that we got, but uh, it's somewhere in uh, 15 to 20% forest cover left in the watershed forest around Noan Lake. And of course, the, the other issue is that Noan Lake is not yet covered by a Republic Act. It has been um, an initial component of the NIPAS ever since the NIPAS was uh, conceived. Um, but uh, then, then there was a, an e-NIPAS recently, but Noan Lake was not included in that list. So um, uh, we were working with, with the local government units and the uh, DNR in uh, Noan Lake to have to, for Noan Lake to have its own uh, Republic Act as a legal protection. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, 
that's that's where I end my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joff, for giving us uh, a view of a view of the work that you do in Owen Lake and uh, the threats to the conservation of uh, the birds there, the migratory birds there. So now I would like to invite uh, a dynamic duo to give uh, their presentation. Uh, a and T Corsino, Adrian and Trinket. Trinket Constantino are avid birders who have been birding for more than 15 years. They are both co-founders of the bird tour company, Birding Adventure Philippines, and members of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. Their love for travel, birds, and wildlife have brought them to wild places, of course, locally and abroad. Adrian is a bird tour leader and Trinket teaches at the university. During this time of COVID-19, they have been enjoying and observing natural history in their garden together with their mini schnauzer, Duco. They are both co-authors of the book, A Naturalist Guide to the Birds of the Philippines. I give the floor now to Adrian and Trinket Constantino who will give a presentation on the water birds of the Pampanga River bird area in Manila Bay. Thank you, Ms. Anadel. Thank so, you. Good morning, everyone. So we we'll just uh, share our screen. I hope everyone's keeping safe in this uh, pandemic. So. So can you see our slides? Good. Okay. So good morning again. So I'm uh, Adrian Constantino. And I'm Trinket Constantino. So uh, we are birders and bird tour leaders for Birding Adventure Philippines. So we've been members of the Wild Bird Club for quite a while now and we have been volunteering for the Asian Water Bird Census for several years. During the past two years, we have been doing the count in Pampanga River to help out Arnie. So he assigned us there. And we enjoy going there even outside of the water bird census season because it's a very interesting bird site for us. We see all of these large congregations of migratory birds and it's a very accessible place. So we, we enjoy birding there. And today we're going to share some of the birds and uh, habitats that we see there. So many thanks Arnie for introducing us to this great place for birding. All right, so just to give you a background, uh, Arnie already showed you maps of Manila Bay earlier, but Pampanga River is in the northwestern side, uh, emptying out into Manila Bay. Of course, the central, central Luzon Plains drain into the Pampanga River, and that drains out, the fresh water drains out and contributes to Manila Bay. So it's bordered by the province of Pampanga on the uh, west side and Bulacan on the east side. If we look at the map, we're going to concentrate on the last five kilometers of the river before it empties out into Manila Bay. And this is a very significant feeding ground for migratory water birds as we had observed. So at the river mouth, at the delta, you actually have two, two municipalities of Pampanga, Makabebe on the west side and Masantol on the east side. But before getting to Masantol, you actually have to pass through uh, municipalities in the province of Bulacan. Uh, uh, across the river, uh, on the sides of the river, you have extensive fish ponds uh, and fish pond industries, aquaculture industries to be seen. So just to give you what the habitat looks like, uh, parts of the river are very shallow, especially at low tide. And this reveals mud flats where the migratory water birds will feed. And this is dotted with a few 
trees, a few mangroves, and a few reed beds. So here you see those mud flats, which are important for the feeding of the migratory birds. There's also deeper water, especially during um, high tide in the center of the river. And this is where the torpedo boats, so the boats there, they don't have a catty, they don't have outriggers uh, because the water can be very shallow. Uh, this is where the torpedo boats pass going out to the bay and traveling between tributaries uh, into the Pampanga River. So you can actually see the opposite bank if you're on one side of the river. Uh, here is Adrian, he's counting birds and he's looking out, uh, he's standing on the east bank on the Masantol side and he's looking across the river and you can view the west bank, Makabebe, and in the background are the mountains of um, Bataan. Uh, of course, if you want to travel by land vehicle to get to the other side, you have to travel way back to MacArthur Highway, several kilometers back, and cross, cross the bridge over that highway, and then travel back to the uh, river mouth. So just to give you an idea what the river mouth looks like, on the west bank and the Makabebe side, it actually ends in a recreational area, some picnic grounds. So we took these uh, from Google Maps, these photos, you have a satellite office for the, on the left side, you have a satellite office for the uh, municipal office, and then you have here uh, a, a few picnic area huts which were set up, and this is visited mostly by okay. weekday bikers who use this as a rest stop after their biking. On the Masantol side, uh, it looks very different. It's not as developed as the other side for recreational activities. You see extensive fish ponds and uh, fish pens all the way out to Manila Bay as far as the eye can see. Uh, you, you, the, the last few kilometers before the river mouth is not paved, it's a dirt road. You see Arnie there <laughs> walking from the very end around two kilometers. At the very end, you do have some uh, mangroves as you see here in the inset photo. And some of the bikers also use this dirt road, but it's not as popular and uh, there's not much as much recreational activity as on the right side. So in this photo, you see the fish ponds on the left side of the road and then the river on the right side of the road. So Adri will talk about some of the highlight birds that uh, are from that we observe at the Pampanga River. So the Pampanga River habitat uh, hosts around 115 species of birds so that's that data is from eBird. So the composition of, do, of that 115 is uh, there's uh, 45 resident birds and uh, 57 migrants, so almost 50-50 between resident and migrants. And then there's seven resident and migrant birds. And then there's, uh, you'd be surprised, there's endemics here. Now there's six Philippine endemics in this uh, Pampanga River habitat. So during, so as Trinket mentioned, we do, we do the Asian water bird census here for a couple of years now. So the first time we were here was in 2018, but it was outside of the AWC season. But uh, officially 2019, we did the Asian water bird census for the Pampanga River, and we were able to record 39 species of water birds and water associated birds. So that's uh, waders, that's uh, kingfishers, and then uh, raptors. So 39 species for 2019, and we were able to count a staggering 48,000 plus birds in one half in, uh, in uh, half, a half a day in one morning so, so these are mostly gulls, gulls terms, terms, and egrets so 40,000 staggering number of birds to count for just one morning and then 2020 we were this year we were able to count uh, 35 species of water birds and water related birds with a total count of, of total individuals of 27,000 birds for this year. No? So in this photo, this is thick. Most of our photos that we're going to show you are, are from the Pampanga River habitat. So this is a common sandpiper. It's a common migrant to the Philippines. So you might um, wonder about the difference in the birds. Uh, what we noticed is that when we did the count in 2020, the fish ponds mm -hmm. were flooded. flooded. Mm -hmm. And so there was less area for the birds to feed mm -hmm. on. And this made a difference in the individual counts. 
Okay, so uh, show you some of the bird species in the Pampanga River habitat. So most of the most of our accounts is composed of uh, huge numbers of black-headed gull. No? So I think in the whole of Luzon, I don't know if it's <laughs> it's one of the places in Luzon where you can see thousands and thousands of black-headed gulls in the migration season. No? So last 2019, we were able to count 27,000 of those gorgeous black-headed gulls no? in one morning, no? 27,000 birds. Okay, so that's how many birds are in uh, Pampanga River. No? And then there's also uh, this, uh, the bird on the right of the black-headed gull is a great nut. No? It's a, it's it, this was mentioned by uh, Dr. Dingley a while earlier and Mr. Arne, no? that it's an endangered the wader. No? It's an endangered water bird and the population in, is decreasing. And uh, the probable justification why the, the population is decreasing is because of the rapid uh, decline, uh, the reclamation no, of uh, in uh, stop oversights like the field feeds. No? So the feeding, the, the feeding sites in the flyway. And then below the great nut okay. is, uh, sorry, below the great nut is the Caspian tern, as uh, Jock mentioned a while ago. It's the biggest of the tern species in the world. No? So probably in the whole of Luzon, this is the best place the to easiest. see. The best place and easiest to see. Uh, to a uh, place to see the Caspian terns. No, it's even bigger than the black-headed gull. No, ganun siya kalaki. Okay, and then also there's uh, mixed in with the black-headed gulls and the Caspian terns are the whiskered terns. No, smaller terns. They're also one of the most numerous and uh, one of the most common migrants to the Philippines. Okay, so we go on to the smaller waders no, or water birds. So we have Pacific Golden Plover in the Pampanga River Delta. No? And then uh, we also have Lesser Sand Plover. Usually we see them in the last 5-10 kilometers from the end, no, from Manila Bay. No? So we also have huge numbers of Kentish Plovers. These are very small waders, no? just probably a little bit bigger than our very common Eurasian tree sparrows. No? There, uh, we have uh, huge numbers of Kentish plovers last 2019. We were able to document 5,000 plus individuals of Kentish plover for one whole morning. And then we also have this red neck stint. No? This is, uh, we have a nice uh, anecdote about this bird because uh, it's a it's classified as near threatened by the bird, by BirdLife International. No, so this small bird, probably bigger, a little bit bigger than our Eurasian tree sparrow, weighs a little bit more than a, a matchbox. No, but it comes from Siberia and flies all the way to Australia. No, stopping at the uh, Yellow Sea, as uh, Dr. Dingley mentioned a while ago. Okay, so good numbers also of red neck stint in uh, Bapanga River. And then we go on to the bigger waders. No? There's common green shanks and then uh, common red shanks. And then in the Pampanga River, there's thousands of marsh sandpipers. But uh, I hope you remembered what Dr. Dingley said earlier. They're common, no? common water birds, common waders, but their population is also decreasing. No? So it, that's, uh, the, it highlights the the importance of our wetlands and our mudflats. And then we also have huge numbers of black wing stilts. These are elegant, very delicate looking, beautiful birds, especially if you see them in flight, flying synchronously across the Pampanga River. Okay? And then the, a huge number of uh, egrets you know, joined during the Asian water bird census. You know, they show up, fortunately for us, you know, and then there's little egret species, uh, intermediate egret species and then uh, great egrets and cattle egrets but occasionally every once in a while we get a Chinese egret no? so it's a IUCN vulnerable species with a population trend of decreasing as well. It's uh, very different from the other egrets because it's very active when it's feeding on the mudflats. Okay so with that I turn you over back to Trinket for the activities on the river. Yeah, so those are just a few of the species of birds that we see during the uh, bird counts. Uh, just to give you an idea of the daily activities, human activities on the river, which might affect uh, the behavior of the birds, uh, I'm going to show you a few, share with you a few of our photos. So um, often at low tide, you will see people like this, um, the locals, a few of them will come and harvest uh, from the river, maybe shellfish and other invertebrates. So you see them approaching 
the bird. Uh, and aside from the people, the dogs from town come and also walk on the uh, riverbed during low tide. They take a look there. And as I had mentioned, there's very high motorboat traffic in the river and of course you also have uh we also observe a few uh pollution uh, solid waste pollution like plastic pollution. so imagine counting those thousands of dogs or waders and then a dog or a boat comes in and they all and start they all flying out. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't really know uh, exactly if these small scale activities will affect the birds, but occasionally we do observe um, some species like this is a great nut again mentioned as being endangered. Uh, he was feeding with some waders and we noticed that he had a bad leg. So this is from Pampanga River. Yes. So this was in March and we were wondering, we, didn't, we don't actually know what the injury result, resulted from, uh, but he was quite active, but we don't know how this injury will affect its survivability. Actually, when we were watching this bird, we were wondering, oh, will this bird survive and make its own uh, way back to its uh, breeding grounds? We were quite worried about it. So when we get to talk to some of the children and also some of the adults, they do say that occasionally they would shoot, shoot at the birds with pellet guns and slingshots. And um, some of the adults would actually hunt, the, especially the night herons for food. So there, aside from that, of course, again, the extensive fish ponds, as far as the eye can see, especially on the uh, uh, Masantol side on the east bank going all the way to Manila Bay and ever expanding. You will also see along the highway the floodgates for flood control and then we often see development. We've seen a lot of development along the road parallel to the river. So there's a lot of development uh, and there's also been dredging of course that will make the water deeper and that will make it that will negatively affect the feeding grounds of the uh, water birds. Uh, when we were there a few weeks ago, there's actually a new. It looks like there's going to be a new, new bridge, bridge being built across the river. So there's a lot of potential for this to be a birding site. A lot, some of our friends go there and really the highlights of uh, birding here would be the huge numbers and the high concentration of water birds during migration season. And it's very interesting to see their behaviors. Occasionally you might get a rare migrant which sends some of the twitchers there, uh, like the rarer gulls. Yeah, last, a couple of years ago, there was a switch, new gull. Uh, new gull yeah. so, sometimes there are these uh, slaty-backed or black-backed gulls, which are not so commonly seen in the Philippines. But really, it's the high concentrations of birds. So for I think Adrian mentioned this, 20, almost 27,000 black-headed gulls and 13,000 black-headed gulls in the past couple of years. You will see them coming in from Manila Bay in the morning and at low tide, they would perch at the exposed mud flats. So thousands and thousands of these gulls mixed in with uh, those rarities maybe I mentioned earlier. And uh, also a lot of these whiskered terns would also rest on the mud flats. And this was mentioned, I think, by Ernie, Arnie also earlier. Uh, some of the waders, uh, sorry, there are no fish flowers in this photo, but there are lots of waders also here you see together with the uh, whiskered turn some uh, Pacific golden plovers. So uh, you really see them congregating especially at uh, low tide on these mud flats to feed. And seeing them feed is a very amazing sight because you will come to realize the importance of this habitat as a a stop over this part of the river with the exposed mud flats is a very important refueling stop for migratory birds because the mud flats allow them to feed. It's a gas station. Yeah, it's again. like a refueling station midway in their um, flyway. And if you see this video so you will see there's really this feeding frenzy these are marsh sandpipers with some stilts and other birds and you see them really for several hours they're just feeding and feeding mm -hmm. non-stop and they're probably they they feed on maybe shellfish and uh, other 
invertebrates like polychaetes and it's an amazing site and again it emphasizes the importance of this as a uh, staging area so we'll end with a short video of more waders feeding so uh, these are red shanks joined by a few other waders and again you can see that feeding frenzy so sometimes that yeah so sometimes you're the we in we show the the kids who come up to us to ask us what we're doing we show the birds to the kids through the scope and of course from far away they just think these are the same bird but they're amazed to look at the birds and see that they're all different and see them up close i think there's a bit of that recorded in this video if so you turn up your volume you yeah can hear some you will kids. you will hear some of the kids talking Yeah, so when we actually show the birds up close to the, not only the kids, but the adults, and they ask us, how many birds have you counted? And we give them the, the actual number of the thousands. They're amazed because they know there's a lot of birds, but hearing the actual numbers, they say, ah, so there are really a lot of birds pala here, as like they say. Uh, and imagine uh, if these feeding areas are inadvertently affected by development, uh, of course, where will all of these birds go? So that's all a very short presentation from us. We'd, so like, to we'd like to thank the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines and Wetlands International for giving us an opportunity to share our experience with the uh, Pampanga River. Yes, and we hope you are able to. It's very, it's a very accessible place. We hope you're able to visit there and see really the spectacle of migration. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. That was an impressive presentation of uh, the birds in Pampanga River. And thank you also for highlighting the importance of the habitats as feeding areas, as refueling areas for the birds, the migratory birds. They feed on shellfish, which are also important for the livelihoods of the people living there. So now um, we are close to noontime, but uh, I beg your indulgence. We can extend for a few more minutes to address the questions that are raised here in the chat box. And uh, uh, while we also have our, our experts here, and I'm so pleased that uh, uh, Dr. Ding Li and others are willing to stay for a little bit longer to address your questions. So now I turn over the, the mic to Mike Liu, the president of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines, who will moderate this uh, open forum, this, this question and answer forum, and close the session. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Anadel. Uh, we have a lot of questions which shows the interest of the people for Manila Bay and other wetlands. Uh, most of the questions were about the Bulacan Airport. But I'll start with the question for Ding Li. Uh, can countries that are signatories to the Convention of Migratory Species be sanctioned for not keeping in terms of the, to the terms of the convention? And what are the legal repercussions? That's a tough question, um, but I have a couple of, I have a short answer uh, and a bit of a long answer. Um, so we have got all these um, international uh, multilateral uh, frameworks here. Um, the challenge for implementing, uh, you know, uh, our obligations to the framework for, for many countries especially is that um, there, there isn't a, a mechanism to penalize countries for um, not fulfilling some of these obligations. So, um, so even if, um, for example, if I sign, if I'm, uh, say country A and I signed onto the Ramsar Convention um, and I have um, not allocated resources, you know, to, to let's say identify Ramsar sites or other kinds of obligations that I'm supposed to live up to. Um, there is no um, way that you could be penalized. So of course, I think we are also mindful of the challenges that many of the countries, um, especially in the tropics, um, 
there are uh, challenges to finding resources to implement conservation. So I, I think this so-called conservation leakage is one of the, the big challenges in the way countries interact at the multilateral level, um, whether in the Ramsar Convention or the CMS or, or CBD. Uh, yeah. So, yep, that's really um, my very short take on the workings on, on obligations of countries to international conventions. Yeah. However, I think um, there is an opportunity for the conventions to, to flag these issues to countries and to encourage them to, to do more. But uh, by and large, as I understand, there's no um, teeth in that sense, yeah, in, in, in penalties, yeah. And one, one more question. Most people think of conservation as forest conservation. How do we get them involved in wetland conservation like, to see wetland conservation as the same level as uh, forest conservation? Mike, I think this is a really good point. Um, I don't know who brought up this question, but I fully, fully agree that we, we do have um, huge, um, I say, mismatches of interests in relation to people being interested in forest conservation versus wetland conservation. I don't feel that, um, I mean, based on what we have seen in, in the region, we know that there is increasing interest in wetlands over time. I mean, thanks to the efforts of the Ramsar Convention, um, big NGOs like Wetlands International, local NGOs and all that. But I think um, by and large in Southeast Asia, there's still a few, there's still a, a very strong prioritization on forest conservation. Um, we find that a lot of the discourse or discussions on conservation, whether you are talking about um, um, Thailand or uh, Malaysia or the Philippines or Indonesia, there's a lot of talk about forest conservation. So I, I think there is, um, there, we, we, we basically need to up our game in, in promoting uh, to the public the importance of wetlands. I think wetlands are also very uh, misunderstood by people. A lot of people have particular um, perspectives of wetlands as swamps and places where there is little biodiversity, but we all know that this is not true. I think there's obviously a need for us to to change the public's impression of wetlands um, and that wetlands are not just um, smelly swamps. I think this 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 is what I have observed across um, different parts of Asia. Um, and I think uh, the good news is that the science in the last couple of years, there's a lot of new science emerging on wetlands in the last couple of years, uh, beginning to demonstrate that wetlands are important at many levels for biodiversity, for ecosystem service, but most of all, wetlands are really getting um, a lot of attention for their role in, in uh, storing up carbon. So wetlands are obviously hugely important in our fight against global climate change. Uh, of course, scientists know this very well, but the public needs to be better aware of it. And I, I guess this is a forum where uh, all of us have a role to play to to promote um, the value, the importance of wetlands to the to the wider public, um, and to change those um, misconceptions we have about wetlands in general. Yeah. Thank you, Dingli. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Arnie, uh, if the airport becomes operational or during the construction of the airport. Uh, the birds will be looking for other sites to go. Do we have plans for predicting or monitoring the spillover sites in order to be steps ahead of the in creeping industrialization? The um, construction um, is probably, I can't remember the figures, going to take five, six years. Uh, you have to bring in hundred thousands of cubic meters of filling materials, three, four, five, six meters high over one area of more than 2,000 hectares. It is difficult to predict what is going to happen, but the general answer I have seen is also by, by government officials, they can just fly somewhere else. I noted that was one example, they could just fly to Kandaba Apparently, uh, the person who wrote that doesn't know that Kandaba has been converted into, uh, into agriculture and that most of the species that you found in the airport are saltwater species. So they will not go to Kandaba, that is a fresh freshwater area. We know from the southern part of Mito Manila 
in the, in the, the municipality of Passai, where you have the largest uh, finalized reclamation, um, including the Mall of Asia area, that British British people during the reclamation of the of the wetland uh, counted enormous amounts of migratory shorebirds, but after that they were all gone. And that fits into the overall negative trend I mentioned in my presentation. The trend for the long distance uh, migratory birds is negative, going down, going down, whether the common ones or the more rare ones. So I can easily say to you all, if you, when you take out the largest intact tidal area in Manila Bay, it represents 25% of what is left, it will have, it will have impacts, negative impacts on the populations. And they have, as I showed in my picture, only about six, seven, eight hundred hectares next to the airport where they can go to. But that is what they call a carrying capacity. The birds is only there if there's enough food. And you cannot store all birds in a tiny little area and expect them to survive. So the life cycle will be, will be in sh the short answer is the life cycle will be interrupted. You may, during the feeding process, see a lot of birds um, but overall, it will have a negative impact. Uh, Arne, you mentioned uh, wildlife reserves uh, coexisting with airports uh, in other countries. Yeah, but there are caveats. Would you like to elaborate on this? There is uh, here again a short answer and a long answer. It's a little bit technically complicated, but if I'm taking off, you know, the Philippines uh, is a member of what we call the International Civil Avi Aviation Organization, ICAO. And all countries that are flying around in the world are members of this uh, international uh, organization. Um, ICAO produces manuals on bird strikes and guidelines and so on. In the Philippines, it's all managed by the the government civil aviation authority car and um, one general set of guide guidance is that you make sure that your airport area has a team of experts that knows how to mitigate bird strikes for those that doesn't know what is a bird strike it is essentially can be also with bats uh, any flying objects that crashes with the airplane and it can have substantial negative impacts anything from the plane crashing down and people dying in the philippines the encounters with bird strikes has so far been quite minimal not on the money side because it costs a lot, a lot of money to repair but there has been no incidences where people outright had, had died because of a, of a bird strike so among the caveats and the reason why for example john f kennedy airport and copenhagen international airport is kind of coexisting coexisting is that the airport authorities has to guarantee that they have conducted the maximum mitigation effort. And the maximum mitigation effort would be that you have special trained, well-equipped uh, mitigation teams. In, in the case, I cannot speak for the United States, but in the case of, of Copenhagen Airport, they even have a license to kill. In, uh, in my many years uh, in working with this airport, I only noted that they, they regulated one species out of many, many species, simply because these birds flew constantly over the runways uh, between a breeding area and a feeding area. In the Philippine setting, to my knowledge, I'm only speaking uh, not on behalf of Wetlands International, but based on my expertise, it has been difficult to meet these international guidelines. So you do not have, uh, as far as I know, any any trained experts in the airports. And the airports that you have in general has not mitigated the landscape, meaning to say the best airport from a safety point of view is only concrete and asphalt, no wetlands, no trees. And in, um, as, as this is not really being implemented in the Philippines, you have quite a very high number of, of hazards observed. You, actually do not have so many strikes. The, the, the airport will most put strikes uh, because it's correlated to the number of movements. Logically is, for example, uh, Naia, Manila International Airport. And um, 
uh, but again, if you compare against the movements, it is a relative low numbers. The second problem is that in uh, compared to John F. Kennedy and Copenhagen airports, there is no one available to identify what bird species they actually have problems with. So if you don't know what species that you have problems with, it is very hard to mitigate. Let me give you one example. Um, it has often been an issue in the existing airport that you have the little Ramsar site right next to right next to uh, to the airport. I'm referring to the Panake, Ram, uh, Panake Wetland Park. But when, when asked, do you know that the birds come from there? They did not know. When asked what species are they, they did not know. One of the most potential bird strike uh, risk species that you have in Manila, uh, aside from domestic pigeons, are actually the black crowned night herons. So it was assumed by a year that the black kind of night herons that problems with in, in, in the existing airport came from, from the Ramsar side. But when asked if they could, when, if they could document they didn't came from Northern Manila where you have colonies of more than 2000 black crowned night herons flying in and out every night, they couldn't ask the questions. So in, in short, the, one of the caveats to reduce possible bird strikes would be one, that you have a baseline understanding of the threats, not only in Talipti, but up to 13 kilometers away. How many birds do you have that potentially can cause bird strikes? This, this uh, baseline study has, it doesn't exist. And the second thing is, the second thing is that everybody uh, has to have some willing of collaboration. Again, following the ICAO, uh, the airport management would then have to be part of management of the surrounding areas. In the case of Talipti, that would mean that the airport authorities would have to be with all LGUs that have fish ponds, there are thousands of fish ponds in southern Bulacan, and discuss what to do with the fish ponds, because in the fish ponds you have the most, most birds actually, all the white egrets, the terns, and so forth and so on. So these are some of the caveats. You have a maximum of a top professional team that knows what they're doing, which has the equipment. In most airports, they don't have the equipment. Um, and you know, if all of these factors are in place, uh, my answer would be yes. But that's my last comment on this one for now. No one can say for sure that this airport will be without bird strikes. And the, the, the sheer location of it along a major flyway, I mentioned that there are 200,000 birds, as far as we know, during midwinter in Manila Bay. We have no clue of idea of how many transmigrant birds are. Trinket and, Trinket and uh, Adrian showed a little, little uh, video. Uh, and I have also been up to Pampanga River and just seen in, in just one morning 13,000 uh, Frenchy eating. Uh, Marsh sandpipers. So we know very, very little about this. And, and, the, and the end answer is it would probably be impossible to avoid bird strikes in Tahiti. So Ar Arne answered the question regarding the safety implications for the avian uh, or the aviation industry as well. Uh, for Sir Anson. Uh, the DNR leads in the Save Manila Bay movement. How do you view reclamation uh, as saving part of Manila, as uh, part of the Save Manila Bay movement? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, the Manila Bay has, uh, well, as we all know, has a um, reclamation plan, which was developed um, many years ago, and well, each um, each um, reclamation project um, in Manila Bay will under undergoes this process. Uh, in my perspective, as, as somebody from the from the Department of Environment. Uh, that we just need to, you know, ensure that uh, these reclamation projects um, um, undergoes the environmental impact assessment process, such that there should be, uh, you know, a strong um, support uh, to uh, 
to re make recommendations whether uh, any adjustments or uh, you know um, outrightly say that it's not uh, recommendable or feasible but you know from the we at the biodiversity management bureau uh, really our uh, advocacy and that's one thing that we want to to being also uh, to, to, to influence um, other colleagues in the department that you know uh, we are not really in into reclamation projects because um, as has been said many times it's uh, it has uh, you know a uh, wide uh, impact in the uh, marine ecosystem so I think that's uh, our take uh, Sir Anson, you're with the BMP, which uh, keeps all the data for these water birds in the whole Philippines, right? Yes, yes. But it's the EMB that issues the EIAs and the ECCs. For, for yes, but there's a yeah, but there's a process uh, within the department that uh, uh, will f the this data should be used uh, or accessed by. Uh, environmental impact uh, assessment reviewers uh, they should use this data our bird data so that they can evaluate properly um, as to the impacts of their, their any projects in the Manila Bay area uh, but you know unfortunately there in the past uh, we have experienced some lapses in you know uh, proper coordination uh, and uh, in you know the the use of this data so that uh, the, uh, such project or any environmental impact assessment we can really see how th these projects are affecting our uh, biological resources in the bay and so uh, we have well as part uh, on the part of the BMB um, uh, we have been uh, running uh, you know uh, trying to you know uh, catch up with the EMB process, you know, the EIA process in the EMB. Uh, so, so to ensure that uh, uh, our data on water birds are, you know, considered in the environmental impact assessment process. Because, for example, the uh, uh, EIA for silver tides uh, for the Bulacan Airport states that the birds there are of least concern, and even just last week, uh, last Friday, uh, for the Navotas reclamation, uh, the, the EIA, uh, the e environmental impact uh, states that the birds there are also of least concern when, in fact, Navotas is like one of the strongholds for the Chinese egrets in Manila Bay. Uh, how, how do you think uh, the BMEB and the EMB can work together to share this data and to influence uh, all these uh, policies? Well, for, for this particular case, um, uh, as I mentioned, we convened uh, the other day with Arnie Jensen and uh, our director has a uh, standing instruction um, to, uh, for the concern unit of our bureau to call out the attention of the Environmental Management Bureau uh, and um, set up a um, uh, meeting or technical conference to to correct that uh, view, um, which was uh, cited in the environmental impact study, um, we just uh, we just got hold of the EIA uh, document, and uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, reviewing it and uh, to provide a uh, formal um, uh, uh, recommendation and any uh, comments on the the. the uh, on the uh, contents of that e uh, environmental impact document. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for the citizen scientists, Adri, Trinket, and Job, how can we support LGUs that protect birds? Maybe you can. That's first, right? How can we support LGUs that protect birds? Well, we encourage them to save the habitats where the birds are located. No? So one example, one very good example will be the Balanga Wetland Park, which is uh, one of the uh, 
uh, projects in collaboration with the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. No? So we, in the Balanga Wetland Park, they, they're earning from the wetlands no? by, by just, just by saving the birds, they are earning from tourism. So maybe we can provide them with incentives, no? maybe tax. Uh, not us. Not us, no? but the government <laughs> maybe can provide like... <laughs> <laughs> na mga what do you call that uh, na mababawasan yung mga tax nila or just probably by earning a lot from the tourism or promoting more of these sites so that people will know about it so people will go to these sites you know? on, on smaller scale I think it's also very important that when we're there that we really engage in the community so that they see what we're doing and they're aware also of what we're doing uh, and we're not strangers who are there just collecting data that will go against them. Uh, if we engage them in, in our case, in bird watching and show them the birds, uh, they have this appreciation, like the video we showed of the kids earlier, and uh, even a, an LGU official who joined us, who asked us in for coffee one morning. Uh, con small conversations like this, I think, make a very big difference. So, yeah. I agree with AJ and Trinket. Uh, to support, we we want to encourage local government units to establish their own uh, protected areas. It may not be under the the umbrella of the NIPAS Act, but they can declare through local ordinances. I see Jason from Bangkong Malapad there, who, who's doing excellent work with Bangkong Malapad. So to encourage them to to protect uh, key areas in their own municipalities, you know. Um, Aside from from making uh, ordinances, local ordinances, they can also uh, deputize their own wardens to protect those areas, to to allocate uh, local government funds to protect those areas. So, yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, one more question for Sir Anson. Uh, the DNR needs the Safe Manila Bay movement. Is there a specific division dedicated for this and how do we help them as, as ordinary citizens? How do we help the St. Manila Bay movement? Well, in the department, there is uh, uh, the Manila Bay uh, uh, office. Um, oh. Which, uh, so, yes, Manila Bay uh, office, uh, development office, which uh, spearheads the uh, you know reg regulating the development activities in the Manila Bay. So yeah, anyone who wishes to uh, you know, raise their concern, um, they can reach out uh, with that uh, office in the in the department. Um, in at the level of the Biodiversity Management Bureau, we have also a focal unit, uh, the Coastal Marine Environment, uh, uh, Coastal Marine Ecosystems. Uh, Division of um, uh, of the the BMB, which provide uh, technical support to the uh, Manila Bay office uh, in terms of uh, uh, assessing um, uh, feasibilities and environmental considerations to uh, developmental projects in the bay. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question: Why did uh, why did SM why did San Miguel Corporation chose to reclaim Manila Bay mudflats for the airport? Uh, I'll answer this. Because they think mudflats are wastelands. And it's cheaper. There's better people to pay off. <laughs> uh, for Arnie, uh, is it possible to plant or create new wetland habitats for migratory birds around the new airport? Wetlands International Philippines has done an incredible job in promoting what we call building the nature, green solutions to restoration. And I uh, know that there's an ongoing dialogue to get uh, the LTUs and hopefully also SMC uh, aware that there are options to restore, uh, restore some wetlands. In general, you will see it is the best strategy to keep what you have, but you have so little left in Manila Bay. And following the strategy of the Manila Bay Master Plan, I can mention to you that the targets for restorations, for example, of tidal flats is about 
is about 2,500 hectares and like, like, like the mango restoration. The big problem is that current policies and understandings, both on the government side, no offense, and on the, on the investor, the private side, is that you just go out at the waterline and plant some mangroves. And then you have done restoration, as you see, for example, in Bulacan. This cannot and will not work. The only way you can restore is to slowly rebuild the tidal flats. We used to say that you have four different fence lines in Manila Bay, both for the birds and for the people living in, in, in this fantastic wet, wetland area. The shallow areas, which provides the food for people and for birds. The tidal flats, which provides again food for local people, the poor people, and for the many, many thousands of migratory birds. And further inland, you have the mango area, which is now fish ponds. And that is where you can build a green belt to restore. But to plant everything with mangroves cannot and will never work. You need first to restore the tidal flats. And uh, it's a very smart solution to this because, you know, everybody's complaining about the sediment loads coming out of the rivers. That's a consequence that you put your main rivers into a canal. So it just become like a CR flush of sediments going out in the bay. Originally, it would have overflowed all of the wetlands, the, the uh, Pampanga Delta, and provided a free natural uh, fertilizer. But that is not happening. So you have in some areas big problems, uh, the developers say, and they do say, with a lot of, uh, of mud. But this mud you need to bring back in and slowly build up your, your, your tidal flats. How long time that solution will last? I cannot say because you have a problem with the increase in seawater, but based on the data I have read, it, it can, if it is well done, uh, last for pretty many years. Well, how can I say that? I can say that, for example, because there are very good experiences, both from my own country in the north, where we are restoring, the government is spending all this money, not on restoration, sorry, not on reclamation, but restoration of wetlands. And in, uh, in the case of Wetlands International, Ms. Anadel can explain more, there is a gigantic effort in Indonesia and in Java where Wetlands International are helping the local governments in restoring uh, huge areas back, both with, uh, with shallow areas and with mangroves. But it is currently not understood, as far as I under understand what I read, uh, by the SMC. And now it is, is it uh, kind of recognized yet in the different, the different bureaus of, uh, of the, the DNR. So there's a need for more dialogue and encouragement. And, and uh, we hope that we can have very good dialogues, not least, for example, with Department of Public Works and Highways, because they are the one also being a main player here because they have the mandate to flood control. And the way they do flood control is mostly very uh, anti, anti birds. The uh, department uh, doesn't seem to have much uh, understanding, knowledge about uh, how you do uh, nature based mitigation of, of, of floods. It's all uh, mostly, you know, concrete solutions. Thank you. Uh, one more question for, uh, let's ask Ding Li to answer this. Uh, have, we identif have you identified invasive plants or species, plants or animals affect, that affect the migratory bird species? That's a really good question. Um, in the flyway, I think um, one of the best examples comes from um, Northeast China and Korea. Um, some of us might be aware that there is um, a, a plant, uh, an invasive North American um, salt marsh grass that has um, in, you know, invaded quite a substantial extent of the coastal mudflats of China and Korea. So um, the problem we are the, basically the problem with these invasive species is that um, when 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 these um, grass take over the mud flat, it reduces substantially the amount of open mud flat that that migratory birds need to feed. Um, at the same time, it also oust um, a, a native species of reed, um, the Phragmites australis, uh, which is used by other you know um, native birds, passerines, and all that. 
So there are indeed some um, really good examples of invasive species um, that are endangering the habitats of our migratory birds. And I am I'm well aware that there are some uh, really good efforts, um, you know, being pushed through in Korea and China uh, to explore ways to, to, to reduce or mitigate the problems posed by these grass. Um, I'm not so aware of uh, animals uh, and how they may affect migratory birds, but I'm aware that at least in in tropical Asia, um, you know, their invasive species are you know widely um, embedded in the ecosystems of many of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, you find that you know in the Philippines, in the Malaysia, in Thailand. Uh, you've got invasive fish, many kinds of invasive fish, um, tilapia, for example, that was pointed out by Job. For, uh, so, so we know that invasive species are present and multiplying quickly in our ecosystems, but we still don't really have that knowledge of how they are impacting uh, our migratory birds per, per se. Um, but at least for, our, for the example that we have from Korea and China, we know that there is some of these invasive species that are a problem um, and there are efforts ongoing to tackle them yeah, at a very large scale. Okay. Thanks, Thank Mike. Thank you very much for, to all the speakers and to all the participants watching us here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. I think uh, we need to make, create another webinar just for the Bulacan Airport. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll turn you back again to Ms. Anadel of Wetlands International. Thank Anadel. you, Mike. Yes, I would like to thank our speakers uh, for giving us a very comprehensive, impressive overview of uh, the challenges in my, the migratory pathway here in the East Asian Flyway and the great uh, opportunities that we have in Manila Bay, in Pampanga, in Bulacan, as well as in Nauhan Lake. Uh, I also would like to thank our participants, both in the Zoom as well as in the Facebook platform, who have uh, stayed with us until this hour and uh, for raising very interesting questions. And uh, I would like to thank also our uh, friends behind the scenes, who without them will not make this uh, webinar successful and, uh, and uh, uh, possible. So we have uh, Jobs who owns the Zoom link, Zoom, um, Zoom account. Uh, we have Riza, our communications officer, and uh, our program assistant, Shin, who also is so creative to make the poster. So without, oh. uh, so uh, I hope that uh, everyone had a, a great time and I wish you a, a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Mabuhay. Maraming salamat po. Bye for now.